I did a 10 day Vipassana meditation retreat and I would like to talk to you about it. I'm gonna cover the context of why I did this, the center that I went to in the UK, the effect that it had on me and how that's affecting me three years later. And then I'm gonna help you make a decision as to whether you should do this. If you're new to this channel, subscribe. We have a wealth of stuff on meditation and I'll put all the links in the description below. But the thing that specifically got me to do this was speaking to Daniel Ingram, who talks about meditation as kind of being a dose response relationship. But if you have a regular practice, let's say you have 365 hours to spend in the year on meditation, he was saying you're better off front loading half of that at the beginning, blast and cruise, almost like a steroid cycle for your meditation practice. And actually that matches up with a lot of the gains that I've made in my life. Whenever I've made big progress in something, it's when I've buckled down and just pounded it for a distinct period of time. For example, you might've seen that I gained 25 kilograms on my bench press in eight weeks following this program. So similar kind of thing, I thought, let's dig deep, let's get some momentum going, push the big rock up the hill and take a running start. I should mention that by that point, I'd done about 350 hours of meditation time in total over the years. It's now probably closer to a thousand hours, but I know people that have gone in completely cold, having never meditated before, and then gone straight into a 10 day retreat. It's a little bit like running Everest in your flip flops, but it can be done. So don't let it put you off. Anyway, to give you some context of the headspace that I was in going on this retreat, I'd been planning it for some time. After having this conversation, I was like, right, I need to do this. And what's the best time in the year to do this? I'm, I'm a pretty busy guy. It's difficult to find 10 days of uninterrupted time where if you don't respond to any of your worldly obligations, you won't just get pounded. And so I thought the easiest way to do this is over Christmas and New Year. That's when people are expected not to reply to their emails and stuff. It, it's, it's stupid, I know, that we even let our lives get to the point where like, oh, if I don't respond to an email within 10 days, like the world could implode. But that's what I had to do. So I'd planned this out. And unfortunately, just before Christmas, I was admitted to hospital. I was quite unwell. I ended up with a bacterial pneumonia and a superimposed EBV and a reactive hepatitis. Um, and then I got sensory motor loss down the left leg. So I was quite unwell and I self-discharged, probably a bit irresponsibly, to do this retreat. My thinking was, the hell am I missing this after all this planning? So I wasn't feeling 100%. And because of the disc issues and the motor loss of my leg, I thought I should probably buy a chair with a back support after getting some advice from David, which we chatted to here. So I bought this chair and it arrived just on the morning that I was meant to leave. Brought it with me across five different train journeys. And then on the final leg of the train journey, I left it on the top of the carriage. So I thought, great start, but here we go. Turned up at the center, which is the International Meditation Center. It's a beautiful country house, very quintessentially British in terms of how it looks and how it's set up. Everyone was really welcoming and you hand in your phone on the first day. We sit down for the welcome dinner and everyone's chatting to each other before the noble silence begins. And I was speaking to this guy who looked like an absolute sage in the skirt and I was like, oh, hello, um, is this your first retreat? And he's like, no. I'm like, oh, okay, have you been on any before? He's like, maybe 20? I'm like, maybe 20. Okay, so 200 days of meditation time. I was like, oh, so um, how does this compare to the Goenka retreats? And he's like, you will come to know. I'm sat there thinking, this guy clearly has a huge penis. And if you've been on a retreat before, you sit at the front of the hall. And I remember seeing him throughout the 10 days, just sat completely still, just unwavering for the whole time, like he had gone deep. Anyway, that night we began the noble silence and everybody had to adopt the five precepts, which are refraining from taking life, not killing. So you had to eat a vegetarian diet while we were there. Refraining from stealing misuse of the senses, so any kind of um, sensual pleasure, which involved any kind of sexual activity as well as just any like stimulation. So putting your phone away, refraining from wrong speech, which was the noble silence and any intoxicants, obviously. So 
that began and there we had 10 days of 4 a.m to 9 p.m of meditation every day so i'll go into the specifics of the meditation but i feel like i should mention the incredible food at this center like it blew me away i think it's the best i've ever eaten which was lucky because i'd lost about 10 kilograms in hospital the the week before but it's all vegetarian food but it was like hazelnut raspberry roulade with a massive selection of cheeses and um, like buffet with 10 different things for every meal rice with mango chili garlic sauce and fresh vegetables and stews and just oh incredible so that was really memorable in itself anyway i'll talk you through the meditation itself so 4 a.m the next day woken up by the guy with a gong from your bunk bed and we go down to the meditation hall they give some instruction for 20 minutes or so and then that's it you begin doing anapana practice which is focusing on the sensation of the breath crossing the tip of the nostrils on the in-breath and the out-breath and you're doing that for the next five days so you're effectively binge watching the exciting show of the tip of your nose and the purpose of this practice is is actually the preparatory phase preparatory phase to sharpen your focus and still the mind so that you can dig into the vipassana practice by day six now what happened here was you're faced with a series of layers of emotion that come up and what happens is it feels like your mind is like a jar of murky water that has been like you're just agitating all the time like throughout your life you're shaking this jar and then you just set it down you stop any external inputs and over the next five days all of the crap in the jar starts to settle and then you see the separation of clear water and all of the sediment at the bottom then the goal by day six is that by applying the vipassana practice you start actually clearing away the sediment so step one is stop agitating the mind like let it settle and build that clarity and then deal with it later and i'll talk to you about that in a second but the purpose of day six to ten is applying vipassana which is now taking that focus that you've built from the tip of your nose and applying it in sections from head to toe applying that same level of crystal precision microscopic clarity that you apply to the sensations that are happening in your body and you just keep running through them and that's the practice now it's the kind of thing that if you've not done this before or if you've not done it to a deep level you just have to experience it to see what comes up because there is a huge universe of stuff inside that starts to open up to you when you do this the way that this is taught by the center is that there's no doctrine but the buddhist framework is applied and so the goal of this whole practice is to recognize the three aspects of reality anatta dukkha and anicca which are no self impermanence and dissatisfaction or unsatisfactoriness those are just insights that will come about organically from doing the practice but the first thing that i realized from just days one to five of the anapana the focus on the tip of the nostril was just how insane we are like luckily i've not struggled with any mental health problems in the past but you realize how random and just nonsense your mind is you're sat there and it's just pumping out stupid thoughts and constant noise in your head and it's only when you tune into it and you're like oh this is going on all the time like how do i get anything done <laughs> so compared to something like psychedelics where you're kind of blasted into this new state of consciousness and having to witness your um all of your stuff in one go a meditation practice is different like you are in control you're the one that's gradually pulling on the golden thread and you're in the driver's seat and so i would say it, it's less traumatic and it's more controlled than some kind of drug assisted method or some big dramatic spiritual method because you're the one that's systematically unpicking your mind so by day two you start to really notice a palpable slowing of your thoughts and space between the thoughts the mind starts to quiet and what then happens is all of your surface emotions start to come up 
the the sediment i guess in that jar starts to really take form and i experienced some really intense emotions with a kind of spooky theme for each day so day one was grief and sadness and day two was fear day three was anger day four was like lust and when this was happening i didn't really know what was going on i was just trusting the process but when i spoke to daniel ingram afterwards he was like oh yeah that's just the anatomy of the mind like everyone experiences those emotions in that order and it was like oh okay so we're not the unique snowflakes that we once thought we were that there is a kind of anatomy to this and it's all very predictable so anyway as this was happening the thoughts and the fears that come up especially on day two and three were almost like a brain damaged version of a tarantino film like I, i was sat there convinced convinced that because i didn't have my phone all this stuff had happened and i couldn't contact anyone to know about it i was convinced that my mum had died that my girlfriend had decided to break up with me that johnny had eaten a peanut m m and got anaphylaxis and died that meanwhile my house had been robbed and that because of the motor function loss in my leg that i'd be disabled forever and have to get my car adapted to have the brakes on the steering wheel it, like it's ridiculous but it just all this stuff come up and it it feels like it's that's it it's true and you your mind just jumps to the worst conclusion because you're sat there just staring at the tip of your nose like there's nothing else to do and what's really interesting is that towards the end you start to realize that these fears and all these kind of recurrent thoughts that you have are just repeated patterns that have always been going on inside your body mind complex that keep coming back and repeating themselves until you pick them up and deal with them if you've ever watched something like jeremy kyle or um jerry springer or any of these kind of or dr phil any of these shows you'll often see that the people who come on seem to have cyclical problems in their life of the same thing that keeps coming back into their lives and circling back they might break up with a partner who treats them a certain way only to fall into the next relationship in the same kind of situation they keep attracting the same stuff because they haven't processed the internal lesson from that and so the universe keeps showing them that lesson again and again until they process it so we've talked about the shedding of the layers of neurosis kind of like layers of an onion and the repeated patterns that come up but the other big challenge for me was the physical pain like the meditation sits are around an hour with 10 or 15 minute break in between and then breaks for food but when you're sitting for that long your back absolutely kills you especially when you've forgotten your bloody chair and then you alternate that you can probably hear mike having a very loud wee next door um when you're alternating between sitting up and then you go oh my back's hurting so i'm going to kneel for a while and then your knees hurt and then you alternate back and forth sitting and kneeling it's it becomes quite uh, quite significant um there's also all of the the very sensory stuff that starts to happen and because there's no stimulation if someone in the room like breaks the noble silence with their ass like it's the funniest thing that happens or if someone's coughing around you you become so annoyed because it's the like that noise fills the room and there was a few moments which i think are a bit more x-rated so i'll, I'll leave them for the podcast that you can listen to at the end where i just couldn't contain my laughter um from uh, a few a few events uh, which you'll have to listen to the podcast and see so hopefully that gives you a picture of what the practice is like and some of the subjective feelings that come up but what were the effects afterwards after you come out of the the 10 days oh and 10 days is a long time subjectively like by day five you're like i have been here forever like i've had enough and then actually by day eight you kind of get a second wind you're almost like well this is my life now so you just get used to it uh, but i'm really impressed with people who can who have done 30 day retreats or 90 day retreats because that just must be a whole new level of taming the monkey mind what are the actual effects of this practice and how did i feel afterwards immediately afterwards coming out of the center and just getting back on the train in the real world it feels like the contrast has been turned up on everything 
sounds are crisper. I listened to music for the first time in 10 days and it was like, whoa, this, like, the, the both the fidelity of the sound but also the emotional fidelity are all turned up. Um, colours seem a bit brighter, like, talking to people is so exciting and so kind of, um, so joyous. They, like, I, they probably, um, probably thought that I was a bit weird because I must have been smiling or really, like, but... Yeah, so that's that's kind of how it feels acutely. And everything almost feels like the first time that you listen to a, a song, like you've been dopamine fasting effectively for that time. And so, of course, the contrast will be turned up. If you're not sure what I mean by dopamine fasting, have a look at this video because it talks about my stupid addiction to a, a mobile game and some of the ways that you can deal with it, with any addiction and get on top of your, your mind again. But generally, after that initial period, I found that I just didn't care about things as much. I wasn't taking the mind so seriously, because you've been sat there for so long just observing the, the sensory components of thoughts to the point where you're like, ah, oh, it's all just stuff flying through consciousness and it's, you don't give it as much weight. Um, now that has, that has remained. It doesn't mean that I've become lazier or less engaged with life, but it's just, you're just not as contracted about the whole thing. These are all subtle effects, but it's nice to see that three years later, that still applies. Johnny thinks that I've become a better speaker since then, and actually looking back on some old videos that you can see from a few years ago, you can see the evidence of that. Like, you can look it back at old videos on the YouTube channel and see some of the progression. I think some of it's just practice of talking to a camera, but other parts are possibly from some of the internal stuff that had been cleared out from that too. The next thing is just that it bumps up the total hours of meditation that you have under your belt. You know, 10 days of, say, 6 to 10 hours a day, it's a lot of hours that you're building up. And what's really interesting is this chart that I found of someone who describes the subjective experiences at different levels of total meditation practice. And, I mean, you can, you can do this with anything. Like, if you look at total number of times that someone's been to the gym, you'll see differences in their physique and levelling up at certain checkpoints. The other thing is I noticed during the retreat, my sleep requirement went down. I guess you're not that active during the day, you're just sitting, so it makes sense that it would go down, but you got used to getting up at 4am. It was never fun, but you got used to it. That didn't last, so I'm back to normal sleeping patterns now. One, one of the other insights from doing the practice is that all thoughts and emotions have a physical sensation counterpart to them. And when you stare at them for long enough, you start to see the space between thoughts and also the kind of subatomic components of sensation or emotion and just a, just more precision of what's going on inside here and realizing that it's not just all contained here, it's really spread throughout the entire body. Looking back, I can see why they did a full five days of Anapana because you do need enough time for the mind to still and to develop that precision so that you can then get the most out of the vipassana practice funnily enough although i still have a meditation practice i don't do vipassana as my method because i think it's more suited to having long periods of time i've heard sam harris describe vipassana as like rubbing two bits of flint together like it can make a fire but you have to keep it going like 24 hours a day before you can start to really build momentum with it. And the method that Daniel Ingram used was Vipassana because he would apply it into everything. Like he'd do it while he was at work. Like he would tune into the sensation of him walking down the corridor in the hospital and the sound of the machines echoing and all these things. He would use it all as grist for the mill for his practice. Whereas my daily practice is much more distinct window of time doing one of the kind of mind-body-heart practices, but I don't do traditional vipassana anymore. Maybe I should, and in some of the centers they actually say you should do two hours a day of meditation. And they say, well, if you do two hours a day, you'll sleep an hour less and you'll be an hour more productive, so no-brainer. And it's like, oh, damn it, like, yeah, that's kind of true, but I've not done two hours a day since then. The final thing to bear in mind is that if you're listening to this and being like, oh, this sounds a bit off the deep end, then 
maybe it's not for you. Like a, a lot of meditation is marketed as a relaxation method, but it's not that at all. It's a way to see through the illusion of your self and reality. So if you're not prepared to be exposed to some of those things and to potentially confront some uncomfortable things about your mind and body, then bank it until you're ready for it. So hopefully that helps to give you some idea of the retreat and to help you make a decision on it. In terms of further reading, I would first of all consider the Blast and Cruise approach with growing in any dimension of your life. Like have a look at the video that we have on adding 25 kilos to my bench press in eight weeks, like just pounding something for a period of time. I've also got a longer version of this talking through the the details of the retreat on our podcast, as well as an account from a friend of mine, Al, who wrote a beautifully written account of his experience. He went a bit deeper. He had some quite transformative experiences from it. And also this video interview from my good friend David on his experience of the 10-day retreat as well. Finally, I would listen to the Daniel Ingram podcast. He is a man who has completed meditation. Like he has spent years in retreat and has so much more depth of understanding of all of this stuff. And if you're new to meditation, you're looking to get started and you want some guided process on how to do it, then listen to our interview with Kit Lachlan. I'll put all the links in the description below, subscribe to the channel, and maybe consider watching this playlist next.